Your players decide they need a fast way off planet. The hut your smuggler recently gave the middle finger to has put a bounty on their heads. That bounty, let's get a little hot under the collar. The few thugs that the spy put down in an alley are a good sign. You gotta get out of there. It's time to steal a starship. There's two choices in town. The Imperial shuttle that just landed and the YT-1300 that's sitting over in Dock 3. The spy points out, the 1300, the old freighter, that'll be a little bit more low profile and probably the better choice. Everybody agrees, but they find out that a bounty hunter owns the starship. But after a little back and forth, they all decide, better to take on a single bounty hunter that's out for their heads than a whole squad of stormtroopers. So they make a play for it. After a quick battle with some security droids and an epic fight against a Trandosian bounty hunter, they now have a starship standing in front of them. Easy. They jump in and they fly away, right? Maybe. Let's talk about stealing a starship. For the rest of this video, we're going to be talking specifically about Fantasy Flight Games, Edge of the Empire, and the other rule sets that go along with that tabletop game. But anything that I say here can be taken to almost any avenue that you want to roleplay in, be it Gary's Mod, Arma, whatnot. This is general information about how the universe works, with specific references to difficulties and dice rolls for that game. Alright, let's get into it. So your party gets to the ship. Time to first get inside. As a GM, the first thing I think about is, what kind of ship are they trying to steal? An old clunker like a YT won't have the most impressive security features. The first probably being a mechanical lock on the ramp. Now remember Ray and the Falcon? Basically, they didn't even have locks. But for the sake of argument, I'd have my players probably roll a mechanics check or a skullduggery check to pick the lock to get inside. The older the ship, the easier the check. If it's some high-class diplomatic shuttle, you can bet it's going to have a minimum of a three purple hard difficulty roll. And like I said, you could make this a mechanics check if you wanted to, if you've got a particular mechanics character who's so starship inclined, or more likely, a skullduggery check, which is your, your, your pickpocking, thieving, and lockpicking, as long as he has the tools to do so, skill set. This is your underhanded skill tree. Make sure that you allow that player to be that thief character, and this is the perfect opportunity to do so. Once inside, if it's a high-end vehicle, you could probably have your players roll a computer's check to get access to the ship's systems, or if it's like the rusty old Falcon, require nothing at all except for the simple startup sequence, a piloting check to get her started and running it out of there. FFG already has some security upgrades built into some of their books, something to remember as a player. If you can steal a ship, the NPCs can steal ships, as my players found out in our recent campaign when they lost their Lambda in all of their gear and equipment that was on it because they let a boss get away and his only escape was their ship. Now the NPCs in my campaigns have to roll the same difficulties that my players do, but since the boss that they let get away was a droid from the Clone Wars with lots of experience and very skilled at computer manipulation, he was easily able to override the security features on a Lambda shuttle, and as they watched, deep in the nebula that they were abandoned in, their ship engines fly away into the distance. It was an interesting moment, and something that they're still reeling from, and has created one of the best, I think, nemesis characters in our campaign so far. So, as I said, there's already security upgrades in the FFG book. Check out the book Special Modifications for some fun upgrades like Security Measures Attachment, uh, which automatically upgrades difficulty rolls twice if someone tries to gain access to the ship in question. Now, for me, if it's a military ship, I'll automatically give it probably a four purple roll to try to gain access to it. One of the main rolls you'll have to do. Uh, if you have security upgrades like this installed, that'll immediately upgrade those four purple dice into two reds and two purples, meaning it's a very difficult roll, and if they roll a despair, they could be in some real trouble. They could uh, activate all kinds of fun things, and you as a GM, have fun with security measures. This could mean anything. This could mean auto blasters could drop down, like the Millennium Falcon systems that you see in A New Hope. Droids could be activated to fight off the borders, or as my players recently found an alarm or beacon could start transmitting immediately to law enforcement in the area or imperial forces in the area that could immediately respond. Now, uh, in that particular instance, my players ended up using that beacon and that shuttle that was constantly going off alarms they could not turn off uh, due to failed computers checks. Uh, they used it as a decoy to escape pursuing Imperial forces by pointing the shuttle towards a distant mountainside and then jumping off onto the mountain as they sailed over, tricking the chasing TIE fighters that were harassing the rest of the party on the ground into following the shuttlecraft 
off into the distance, allowing them to escape. It was clever. It used what was in front of them, and uh, it did end up having one player actually miss the jump a little bit and roll partially down the hill, taking a critical injury, which became even better of a heroic moment. It was awesome and a highly, uh, just highly cinematic uh, moment in our campaign. I couldn't, I can't understate how these these kind of mechanics can really add to a story and the creativity of the players. So now our heroes have taken out the bounty hunter and are hotwired an old freighter. They're done, right? They now have a ship. All done. It's theirs. They've called intergalactic dibs. Uh, not quite. So there's a difference between legally buying a starship and just calling dibs on one. That brings us to the boss system. If your player can just steal a ship, then why in the world would they build up and save the 80,000 plus and way plus the costs of starships uh, it goes up exponentially? Why would they ever bother to earn one if they could just steal one and walk away with it? And then why would they bother trying to make any credits if they could just steal ships and sell them for how much they're worth? Well, that's where the boss system comes in. The Bureau of Ships and Services, or BOSS, is responsible for assigning all transponder codes to all starships that ply the hyperspace lanes, and most importantly, tracking their movement through space. They're like the IRS of Star Wars. No one messes with them. Not even the Empire. Being around for 18,000 years before the Battle of Yavin means that they have morphed uh, the Bureau into this close-knit family that has kept secrets on everyone. Uh, every major shipyard, every way station, every docking port has a boss office inside it. If it dealt with starships traveling in, in Republic space, Hape space, Hut space, anywhere that was recognized as civilized, boss was there controlling the hyperspace lanes, monitoring them, and making sure that he who has bought the ship maintains the ship and keeps the ship. That doesn't mean that they can't be fooled. That doesn't mean that they can't be hacked. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but if it has to do with ships traveling, then the boss, the Bureau of Ships and Services, keeps track of it. And you have to pay the piper with them. So when you buy a ship, every ship captain is giving a boss certified data pad, which acts like uh, the official papers for a ship, for its manifest, for its crew, for its cargo. This is the boss data pad. Now, what's cool about the boss data pads are they're described as having a really bizarre input uh, device, uh, port that you hook into if you want to add data to it, but reading data and copying data off it is actually used a normal data port. Uh, the reason being is that if you want to change or add anything to a boss data pad, it is incredibly, incredibly difficult to do so. All, the most badass of uh, slicers can actually manage to adjust or change things that are on these data pads, and in which case, even if you do, it won't match the uh, data that the boss system has. Now, having adequate updated uh, files from the boss system requires a fairly expensive monthly uh, subscription to the service. So most outer rim areas, most places away from the mid rim and the core, uh, and even in the colonies, won't have the most updated files from boss. They'll be using older files and only update them sporadically. So keep that in mind for your players who have stolen a ship and have maybe fake information about that ship, that those files may not automatically be upgraded. And it's up to you as a GM on how you want to play that and use that. Uh, so keep that in mind. So uh, because our party has stolen this YT, they don't have the proper boss paperwork. They have paperwork, but it doesn't match the right names. It doesn't have the right crew names on it. And it obviously doesn't show them as the proper owners of this ship. Also, there's the matter of the transponder, which is something that the boss uh, system actually uh, controls and maintains. Each ship has a transponder code burned into its sublight engines that, when active, constantly transmit the ship's name, type, owner, and other pertinent data, like what faction or government they have ties to. Tampering with this is a major offense, and I cannot stress this enough, a major offense if it is found out about, because remember, Everything in the Star Wars universe relies on hyperspace lanes and ship travel. And for someone to be messing around with that is a big deal for everyone involved, particularly for friend or foe identification in wartime. So turning it off or just not having a transponder, by the way, is just as if not more suspicious. If you're a ship flying through a sector with no transponder, you are a danger to navigation. And on the flip side, you could be a threat for everyone. So keep that in mind if your players have the bright idea of just trying to dismantle or take out or change their transponder. 
Uh, if it doesn't ma match any kind of known system or the boss system, then it's going to be very suspicious to the point of it'd be more suspicious than just having a stolen ship. At least they'll know what that is. And in some areas in space, they may not care that it's stolen. So keep that in mind as well. There are a few ships in the universe that have modified transponder codes. The Millennium Falcon is one which actually has multiples. There's a few things, special modifications, Fly Casual has stuff on this. Uh, these are two expansion books for the FFG version of the game, uh, which actually talk about how in different ways you can modify your transponder codes. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But the Falcon actually had multiple codes, uh, and the Ghost from Star Wars Rebels actually had a sweet baffled energy dampening engine system that made it so uh, the ship would come across as just solar radiation and a set of jammers that could actually jam out completely the transponder or to change and modify the transponder to mimic other types of ships or vessels. Uh, this also changed you know, their entire energy like makeup as they were picked up by other ships in the distance. Very cool. All those upgrades, again, are listed in some of the FFG books. Uh, but you as a GM can also, if you don't have those books, just kind of come up with the lore a bit yourself. You know the lore from these videos, you can come up with roles and ways for them to make those modifications and just have them take up a hard point on the ship if you want to. Uh, it's up to you as a GM how you want to roll it. So, with a stolen ship, no paperwork, and a bounty, what seemed like the perfect getaway has it turned into a major, major problem and story point. So, what options do the player have? Well, uh, if they have a, a high-end slicer and a mechanic on the crew, it's possible to add a new code to the ship and mimic an existing ship. Now, this is no easy feat and requires the players to get a hold of uh, a new code that actually matches through the boss registry. Or they could try to bribe a boss official. Now this could mean that they're getting into a boss office and hacking into the system that's there. This could mean that they're bribing an official at some remote outpost and doing a lot of charm checks. They have to use the skills, and this is something that I wanna reinforce with my players as well. They have to use the skills that they're good at, come up with solutions that they have the skills and knowledge and expertise to pull off, or they may find themselves even in deeper water than they were beforehand. Uh, depending on the individual and the circumstances of bribing someone, this could most likely, uh, no matter what, it's going to be a difficult task. Uh, if they have a relationship with maybe that port or that city, a good one, that could be uh, in their favor. Maybe if you boost die with those types of roles. Um, or they may just take a buttload of credits. It, it's very much up to the GM and how the players want to come up with solutions to these problems to help you tell these stories. Now, on the flip side of all this, they could find a well-known forger that could get the job done for them, or maybe a chop shop. Uh, that could be, even in the core worlds, there's most likely gonna be a chop shop for stolen vehicles and ships that know how to get around these systems or have already bribed the right officials. So those are other ways around these, but they have to be found and convinced to work with the players. So that's up to the players to kind of figure out and up for you as the GM to introduce lots of fun and interesting characters and the costs. Nothing is done for free in the Star Wars universe. So if they don't have credits, what do they have? What kind of deal can they make? What kind of job can they do to uh, get on the right side of a chop shop, a forger, uh, a, deep, a deep network slicer for the holonet? There's a lot of different contexts that they could get just from the fact that they wanted to steal a starship and now they want to keep it. Uh, or maybe they just want to dump it and find another one. Maybe they want to become crew on a different ship because they realize this is just too hard of a job for them where they're at. Uh, it all builds into the greater story, particularly if you're doing an Edge of the Empire campaign. I have the rule book next to me. That's what I'm looking off screen at. Uh, there's a lot of great stories that can come out of the simple fact that they need to escape and find a ship. Boom. What is more, what is more Edge of the Empire than trying to escape on a stolen ship and having to go through all of the shenanigans to make that work? Uh, for, absolutely, absolutely. I think running into a smuggler who knows a guy who knows a guy uh, and having to do a deal with that smuggler or crew with that smuggler before he'll give him the contacts and find out if he'd trust him or not. Everything could be, it could be a trap. There's all kinds of stories that you can have fun with there. Uh, so as a GM, my, my final parting advice here is make stealing a ship in the universe uh, that is completely reliant on hyperspace travel a big deal. Uh, even more so if the players decide to commandeer something imperial. Just because they can steal it doesn't mean they get to keep it. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be super useful for all the things that they want to do with it. Uh, but talk, talk about, it's like stealing a cop car. Uh, if the Lambda shuttle isn't exactly something that is a subtle ship and they don't call it the imperial shuttle for nothing, it is a symbol of the empire. Uh, but again, this universe lives and breathes and mostly eats because of the hyperspace lanes and the ships that fly them. It is a big deal. It's like stealing a horse in the Old West. Uh, they would hang you 
for something like that. And you can probably assume in Star Wars, it's a very similar situation. So, uh, even pirates in this universe will avoid flying stolen flag ships near anything civilized because nobody wants that kind of heat. As a GM, though, don't think of the boss system or the internal ship security systems as ways to punish your players. Uh, these are... Uh, you know, don't, don't punish them for going off the rails or coming up with unique stories. Play with those stories. Work with the decisions that your players are making. And if they don't understand this universe, this is a great way to teach them about it in a fun, story-like uh, avenue. Right? And if they're playing a character who has a lot of history with maybe they know, they know about boosting um, hovercraft, they know about boosting uh, you know, ground vehicles, then they would understand the basis of this and explain it to them. Explain it to them in a way that it's like, you would know this. Your character would know this, so here's the information that you know. Maybe the rest of the party don't. And then they can explain it to the rest of the party. Kind of a fun, uh, you know, they're, they're in on the crime side of things, and they can explain how to get around some of these systems, or at least the ways that are most known. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the whole point of all of this is that uh, you want to make vessels, starships particularly, earned rewards, and not something that somebody can just walk in and call dibs on. Make the players feel like they earned them. And more importantly, use these scenarios and these obstacles to overcome to make your players shine. Look at the skills that they have taken, that they have bought into. And this is a chance for them to use those skills to help the party and to establish what could be, eventually, uh, in your campaign, the player's home. So, all right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below what system that you would like to see explored a little bit more in the next episode. I'm really enjoying this GM tip series for Star Wars. Uh, there's lots of lore that I want to cover. Imperial Intelligence is one that I've already mentioned. Uh, and then a few more mechanic stuff for FFG, particularly somebody mentioned in the comments section, uh, vehicle combat versus player uh, personal scale players. Yeah, people with hand weapons, right? With small arms. Uh, and how do you deal with that? How do you make that feel cinematic and with the system, how in the world can they even possibly defeat something like that because of the armor system? It's a, it's, a, it's a detailed system. It is hard to understand reading through the rule set. I think vehicle combat in this is the hardest thing to get your head around. Um, and we will talk about both of those topics in a later video. All right, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.